Um, what I would like to talk to you about is a background on what we do or what we think about in Port City Futures and what this actually could mean also for the Euro Delta. So first of all, the, there is a couple of ideas that are un underlying our Port City Futures uh, Leiden Delft Erasmus collaboration. Um, and I invite you all to go to our, to our website. Um, do you see the sharing actually? It tells me it's paused. No, not, not yet. We see your um, whole screen. So also yeah. uh, with the notes. Oh, okay. Now that's not the idea. Let me go back once more. Uh, hold on. Why does this not? Uh, give me one second. Usually it works very well, but then not that we do this all day long. Okay. Give me. There we go. I will start again. So um, the invitation to you is this showing now? Still not. Some no, still not. It tells me it's yes. sharing. Now yes. it's fine. Okay. Now it's fine. Okay, thanks. Apologies. So I would like to invite you to look at the Port City Futures website to also see what the goal of this uh, collaboration is. But I'm not going to present you what we do. I would try to use the things that we focus on to talk about the, the Euro Delta um, concept and the project. Now, for me, it seems important to tie together space, society, and culture. And I think that some of the comments yesterday already pointed in that direction. On the one hand, this is a physical reality, and that's what we have to engage with. It's important to have economic numbers and other statistics, but it all takes place in space. And so this interaction between people, between what we think about places and the place itself, I think is very important. And that also means not only taking into account technological innovation, and we had proposals yesterday about single uh, tickets to travel on single uh, different modes of transportation, but we also had com comments about the importance of recognizing the culture of water, for example. So I would really agree with the fact that we need to bring all of these together, that we need to talk about border crossings and not just on land, but also with the sea. The document map mentions mapping quite a bit, and I think it's a really important research methodology, but we also have to be aware of what we do. And in the end, I would really like to plead for a value-based approach. So I would like to take you on a quick tour with a number of images and hope that some of this sticks and might even inspire some of the projects. Now, the new generation podium starts with this beautiful picture. Uh, and it shows us a lot, but it also shows us some things that are missing. And maybe that is something where the new generation also wants to look at. Because the sea is not empty. The sea is filled with all kinds of activities, and these activities very much determine what is going on in the hinterland, on the rivers, uh, in the cities, on the port cities that are along the Rhine Valley, for example. So first question, can we populate the water and think both about it as a space, as a place, and uh, as a cultural um, location? So for me, I would like to invite you to start the view of the project from the sea to see the North Sea as a commons. And this is actually also the, um, the, the foundation of a book that we just published on the urbanization of the sea. And the idea behind this is that if we change our focus from a land-based one to a sea-based one, it will also help us overcome some of the national borders, the other disputes and the other implications of uh, research, of languages and so on that we often face. And it also means that we have to think the sea, think of the port of Rotterdam that needs access to water and the challenges that keeping the water out means for other areas. So there's always this relation between sea and land that you might want to strengthen. Now, I mentioned mapping as a theme. Mapping is really interesting and important, and it can be a research tool. So what we've been trying to do now is to map around the North Sea several of the port city regions. 
And I think this could also be a way to um, explore the cities inside the Euro Delta on a similar scale based on similar challenges that they've been facing. So what we've been doing is looking at it through time um, so that we not only look at one time, one moment in time through space or one space through time, but really to think about changing perspectives. And in this case, how does the relation between water and land between port and city change over time? Now, so far we've done this for three cities, but what we are trying to do is develop a methodology that can then be applied to other cities to go beyond the pure um, focus on economic geography where you have beautiful maps, but they don't land in space. They don't land at any scale. You've been asking to, to, for people at what scale they work. Now, trying to understand what the drivers are between be, uh, behind different developments is very important. And I think we can, from a historical perspective, understand what the values are that have driven specific developments. So in the case of Rotterdam, for example, our mapping, I would argue, shows that the port has been in the lead where the cities have followed. In case of London, we've seen the port escaping from the city with the headquarters still remaining there, but the port really having left the city in different ways that, the, that it has in, um, in Rotterdam. And in the case of Hamburg, where we really have a tandem, uh, and in this mapping, we've also in included institutional boundaries to show how port and city authorities have found a way to balance each other over time. Now, we've started to expand this methodology to other places. There's colleagues now work working on the Adriatic. Um, but also bringing in, for example, maritime flows, shipping into this picture and comparing what happens to the various major ports around the Adriatic, including uh, Venice, Rijeka, Ravenna and Copa. And you do see the relationship that is changing between the industrial ports and the city of Venice here, for example, over time, and both in terms of the scales of this relationship, um, but also what it means then for the, for the heritage of the site, for the functionality of the site, for the institutional governance. And so these are two examples from the seaside, from the coasts, but I'm sure we could be doing the same thing, and I think we should be doing the thing, same things. For example, Duisburg port, the world's largest inland port. And so let's focus also in the uh, projects that we're developing, and you're saying this here, to also on the, on the rivers and the cities that are related to them. Now, this is also a call to, again, rethink mapping. It's a wonderful, wonderful map, but it raises the question for me, so where is the water? Where are the rivers? Where are the ships? What's the relation between smaller cities that are port cities and other cities? And I would like to make one more point. So I've been arguing that there's a port city scape that reaches from the sea to the hinterland logistics infrastructure, but it's also represented. So what of this spatial areas do we actually see and consider? So what's the mindset that is related to it? And we've been arguing that port cities are usually very strong cities. They're very resilient. They are used to uh, adapt to, to changing conditions and to promote them. But that also means a lot of frictions. And these frictions, I think, are very important to bring to the front. And when you think about the Euro Delta, and I like this website of windy.com, showing us the pollution. This pollution is not stopping at sea or land borders or at national borders or somewhere else. So if we really want to improve it, and this is just on 14 or 15 or 18 miles, it's very recently, 14 May, you see how much pollution is generated. So we need to find ways to overcome the dualities, the challenges between port and city, between land and sea. And I just would like to point you to this group, VEEK, which is a 1517 created group of commercial people in Hamburg. Uh, who have come together around shared values. So honesty, uh, punctuality, trade. And I find it really interesting to see that it's possible to have decision makers 
gather around values as a means to guide their actions. And so as we want to overcome dualities of industry and city, of heritage and migration, of logistics, etc., how do we do this? And can a value-based approach help us engage with these challenges? So from that perspective, and here's a little more moment of uh, advertisement in there, we've just, we're launching a course on reimagining port cities, understanding space, society, and culture. If anybody is interested, it starts on the 26th. But what I'm arguing is that when you develop projects, and this is a design project from my students, take into account the values that you want to achieve. Think about a long-term future, even as you want to take small steps, but first put a, uh, put a dot on the horizon, 2080, and then think about the adaptive strategies that can actually get you where you want to be uh, to make sure that these are also the goals. And to end with, this is also a lesson from history. If we look back how many changes have happened in say the last 60 years, then think about what changes can happen in the next 60 years and what it would help, what it would need to make them happen. And if I am ending on a, on a, on a, on a critical note or on a note to launch you into design, maybe our smartphones have done more to urban space than spatial planning has done when you just think about how it has transformed space. So that may be something up for discussion. Thank you very much.